it's going to be, as the plan says today, it's going to be 116 units, and it's going to be a mix of uh, 20 townhomes and 96 apartment buildings. And the apartments, or well, not apartment buildings. There's only four buildings, but there's 24 units in each building. Right now, rents are you know 1050 to 1250 for brand new two bedrooms. Some stuff may stretch to 1500, depending on how nice you go. But that that's not our game. And then the three bedrooms, I, I don't know where we'll land on those right now, but it's probably around 1300 give or take, probably 10% one way or the other. And so the goal is, you know, to service that working class community, right? That household income in the, for North Carolina, the average uh, median income is right at $55,000. And so we want those folks to be able to live in our community if they don't have a home. Hey, how's it going, guys? This is Dan Wynn with the Financial Freedom Journal. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Jerome Myers. I'm just going to give you a quick background about him, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and get into the interview. So, uh, Jerome Myers is the owner of the Myers Development Group. Uh, Mr. Myers has a passion of helping people turn their dreams into reality, and he's the asset manager, manager of over 75 units across Virginia and North Carolina. His company's goal is to have ownership of over 1,000 units prior to 2030. Very lofty goals, and uh, looking forward to seeing you accomplish this. So, uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Myers. Really, really appreciate you coming on. Hey, Dan, it's good to be here. Please call me Jerome, man. I'm not <laughs> at all. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so, yeah, thank you for coming on the show, Jerome. I really, really appreciate it. Um, been watching your, been uh, following your IG, your Instagram, and uh, I love, I love how you're posting things uh, pretty regularly and. You know, if you have, if you're not following Jerome, then de definitely uh, go ahead and do that. I'll have the links down below. So um, let's get into it. Uh, can you tell us about yourself, a little bit of, about your background, you know, how you got into real estate? Yeah, sure, man. I, um, I'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. Grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, my dad was 82nd Airborne, and he uh -huh. made some pretty distinct career choices um, while I was there, and some of it held back his career. He was an enlisted man. Um, and instead of us traveling all over the world, he took two one-year deployments to a career, and he missed out on the Gulf War and uh, any other live combat action. But I actually got to live in the same house from three months old until I went to college. Ooh. And oh, that's very different. He had some opportunities to go to you know D.C., but his whole thing was, hey, you want, I want you to have some roots. And so we, we stayed in that same house and actually my grandmother lives in it today. Um, and so that kind of set the foundation for real estate. Ownership was important. And so, you know, I matriculated through college, played football there, um, got an engineering degree. And I had two choices I could make. I could either go on and do a PhD program at University of South Florida or go into the workforce. And I wanted to start accumulating wealth, so I cho chose to start my career. So I started working for a power company, and I got to close on my first home the week before I actually started my job. I used a letter showing my sign-in bonus, and it was 2005, so, you know, loans were a little loosey-goosey compared to what they are today. <laughs> yeah, so I, was able to, I got in an 80-20 loan where, you know, I got an 80% down payment and then a 20% uh, second to kind of cover the down payment because I didn't really have any cash. However, I was fortunate enough to graduate college without any student debt. Um, and so from there, I, I worked and saved aggressively, lived really frugally. Um, and a couple of years in, I was like, man, I, I really want to figure out a way to decouple my time from dollars. I figured out in college working in a fitness center that I didn't want to do that. It was a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I think there was about an hour left on my shift and I closed down early and went back to my room and the administrator came back. They were like, what are you doing? People are trying to get into the facility and you're not there to watch over them. I was like, well, I mean, what are they going to do in 45 minutes? They're not going to get be able to get a workout in. He's like, it doesn't matter. You get paid for your time, not whether or not somebody's actually going. And I was like, this is crazy, complete waste of my time. And so, you know, fast forward, I'm doing work, 
trying to be productive. And I was like, this just doesn't make sense. Why do I have to be in one place at a, in a, at a given time? And so we began looking for alternatives to, you know, the traditional story, go somewhere, work for 30, 40 years, hopefully save up enough money, start drawing social security, and then you can retire. Uh, I, I was probably the only person under 35 in the group I was working in. And all the guys were really close to retirement age and all they kept talking about was retirement. So I was like, Hey man, I want to retire too. And the one guy said, Hey, retirement isn't an age. It's a number, right? You got to figure out what your retirement number is. And I was like, what does that mean? He was like, well, you, you got to get enough money into the bank account or the savings account that you can live off of the money when you retire. And whatever that number is, you got to get it in there. And the faster you get it in there, the quicker you get to retire. I was like, oh, well, that sounds pretty simple. And then I got exposed to multifamily investing. It's like, I can create the cash flow without piling up this big number in the bank account and going down the path of retiring at 55, 60, 70, whatever it is. And so that's what we started doing. Um, prior, I guess a few years prior to that, we had pretty big savings and some access to credit lines. So we started doing some private money lending and we were charging in the 20% range for um, money. And I was what? like, why don't these guys care about paying this amount of money? And yeah, exactly. Um, and the reality was they were making two and 300%. So what did they care about my little 20%? It was just kind of a cost of doing business. And so, you know, I, I was like, well, I need to be flipping because I could turn my money over double and triple it in over the course of three, four, six, eight months, depending on how big the rehab is. And so I did that for a while. Then I realized that was just another job. Like being an active flipper sucked. I mean, I was going to Lowe's, I was managing contractors and, you know, there are some really good ones out there, but there's some really bad ones and going through and kissing all the frogs to try to get the team in place. I just didn't like it. And so as I was evaluating alternatives, I was just like, apartments is the way to go. Like, it gives you every facet of it. If you think about wholesaling, if you think about flipping, and if you think about buy and hold, it is all encompassing. You got to use the marketing strategies from wholesaling. You got to rehab units, but you don't have negative cash flow if you do it properly. And then the buy and hold piece is what everybody's looking for. And so that stream of income, every time you buy a new asset, you add to your stream of income. And so now it's not so much about, you know, making as much money as I can and putting it in a savings account. It's about making as much money as I can and growing more assets and then pulling additional capital in from different JV partners to buy deals so that we can keep adding to our cash flow. And so that's my game. Um, the goal is to partner with about a hundred people and hold a thousand doors. And in doing that, you know, it'll set me and a bunch of other people free because we decoupled our time for money. Wow. So, <laughs> so you, you said a lot there and I was trying to take some, take a few notes so I can uh, mention, so we can unpack this just a little yeah. bit because you put out a lot of, a lot of gems and uh, I love your story. So first off, the very first thing you said, you mentioned uh, you went down to USF and played football. Uh, big I-4 war guy. I went to UCF, so we kind of talked about that a little bit. So that's uh, that's cool. So you played football for you, USF? No, 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 no. So that was going to be my PhD program. I actually okay. went to North Carolina Agricultural Technical okay, State. Okay, okay, okay. I thought you yeah. I thought you were saying you played football for UC, USF. No, okay. Cool, 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 no. cool. All right, and uh, you were you're at the 82nd, you know, all the way. So I got a lot of buddies up there. So that's, that's awesome. It's pretty cool that you were able to stabilize um, and, and stay in one location from um, elementary to college, which is almost unheard of. But I probably right. the only place you could probably do that at is the 82nd because there's so many units there. So that's cool. Um, now, getting into your first home, I want to just uh, talk about that just a little bit. So, and what that meant to you and what that did to your mindset. Um, it seemed like you found out at a very early age through talking to uh, your friends going through that whole, um, I think you said you're working at a gym, that whole process. It yeah. seemed like, that that kind of flipped the light switch just uh, just uh, in itself. You're trading your time for money. Um, you didn't really like that too much. So what did that first home do for you? And, and, and what, what was that like? Oh, man, it was amazing. So, you know, it was, it was at the height of the real estate. So I couldn't actually afford to buy in Richmond, at least nothing that I wanted. So 
you know, I got this house with a fully finished basement, three bedrooms, acreage, a pond. I was like, man, I'm living the life. Um, but it gave me the understanding that you've got to buy assets. The other thing that it did is it was a shock because in North Carolina, I thought I was going to be able to buy a house for around $100,000 and have a pretty nice house. And I could have. But since I was in Virginia, I spent twice that. And I got myself in this place where I was pushing up against my ceiling from an income standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, I knew that it was going to go up. But the fact of the matter is I didn't have the space that I needed in order to go buy stuff that was cash producing. Right. So I basically was spending all my money on my bills in the first couple of years. And that didn't make sense to me. I knew that I and I strayed away from my plan. I, my goal was to buy a home to live in and also buy something for to rent out. And now that I still actually own that property and it's a rental property for me. Uh, but, you know, the goal has to be to buy cash producing assets. Dead assets are no fun, and I've tried to get away from them as far as I can. I call them alligators, man. I, I don't want to feed any alligators, right? I want every property that I own to be a goose, and it's putting all, giving us eggs instead of, you know, sending alligators to, we're feeding the alligators. I love that. I love that. I've never heard that one before. So feeding the alligator, or feeding the goose instead of the, the alligators, feeding the goose that lays the golden egg, the golden eggs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. So going into, um, you know, like I said, you found out at an early age, relatively early age, earlier than most that, you know, trading time for money is not the way to go. And um, another another thing that you said that I loved that I guess you heard that from someone else is retirement isn't an age. It's a number. It's, it's a number, basically your, your freedom number. I've talked about that a few times in uh, different uh, YouTube ep episodes about hey finding your freedom number and you know making sure you have enough cash flow through your assets to sustain whatever lifestyle that you want to want to live. So thought that was great. So let's talk about just a, a little bit about the money. You said you were you you got into money lending, which I believe you may still be doing. But twenty percent, uh, how did that come about? And what time frame was that? Because I know that that's significant as well. Yeah. So we. We were making loans and they were always term loans, right? So it wasn't an annualized percentage. So if we loaned money for six months, it was 20% on the six months or 24% on the six months. Um, and then there was a penalty period if they went over. Um, yeah, I, I watched other people. So I, I, I got in the real estate investing circle because I knew that's where I wanted to shift to. And I was watching them. And as I looked at people's businesses, I was like, well, I can't help you with that that guy's charging you this, I'm willing to charge you a little bit less. Like, okay, I'll, I'll give you the money, no points, and you pay me at the, when you sell the property. And so for that convenience of not having a monthly payment, people are willing to pay a little bit more. For that convenience of not having to come out their pocket to close the loan, they're willing to pay a little bit more. Now, with that said, they don't really feel like it's their money, right? It's just the equity in the deal. And so they don't value it. It's money coming out of somebody else's pocket. And so that's why that is the psychology that goes behind it. Now, the markets are shifting a little bit. And so, you know, lenders are getting a little bit less for their money. But with that said, I was working on a wholesale transaction about three weeks ago. And I reached out to one of the hard money guys that I know. And he said, yeah, give me 50% of my money. And he didn't position it that way. He basically said, for the 90000 that you need to close it, give me back, I think he said, uh, give me back 20000 in six months. And I was like, uh, I did the math. I was like, what are you doing? And I told him, I was like, dude, this, that hurt my feelings. Like, I thought we were friends. And, <laughs> and he was anchoring. He, I don't think he actually expected to get that. Well, I, I knew he didn't expect to get it from me. But, you know, when people, it's, it's kind of like when in a wholesale game, if people are desperate for money, they're desperate to do the transaction, they'll make illogical decisions. And so while I wasn't getting 50%, you know, 20% was kind of the cost of doing business. And I guess the other thing is I wasn't, most of the time I wasn't in first position. I was doing bridge funding. So yeah. being in a second position, is a whole lot more risky than, you know, having a first position recorded lien on the property. 
Yeah, because you someone else has to get their money before. If someone defaults, someone has to get their money first, and then then if there's any money left over, then you can get the uh, you can get it. So that's how you were tied to the asset by a second position. That was going to be my second question as well. So, yeah. okay, are you still are you still? Well, I'm assuming you're not doing the lending anymore. You're just purely focused on multifamily and uh, syndication right now, correct? Well, no, I actually opened up a brokerage with um, one of my funding partners. So now we actually do do stuff, and the majority of what we want to do is refinance stuff that's been bought and repositioned um, okay so, yeah i mean we, we do have access to capital if somebody's out there looking for that so like five year balloon 30, 25 year amortized type i mean those, are those the type okay got it, five got year it. balloon 30 year m okay good stuff good stuff um i'll keep that in mind when uh <laughs> when it's time to, when it's uh when i close on the first uh larger multifamily. so that's awesome okay. um so you mentioned um, what you're doing now, as far as um, as far as syndicating. Can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Like, what, where where are you at right now? Um, your first, actually, let's back up. Your first um, syndication or your first large multifamily deal or larger first uh, multifamily deal. Mm -hmm. uh, can you walk us through that? Maybe what were some of the numbers, and then how what the time frame was? Maybe some of the lessons that you learned as well. Oh man, so. It's funny you bring that up because it, it it emphasizes the point that everything has to happen the way that it happened in order for you to get to where you want to be. And so after I left corporate America, I thought I was just going to walk into the bank, get a loan, go buy a property. Well, they, I went to probably five or six different banks and it's like, we don't care about your credit score. Yeah, you got some cash in the bank, but we don't care about that either. We want experience. And so I got turned away. I had a deal identified. I knew what I could buy it for. had a pretty good idea what the rehab was going to be on it. And everybody passed. Everybody passed. And so I was standing on the porch of one of my flips. And a fellow investor pulled up. He was like, hey, man, I'm looking at an apartment building. Um, do you have any interest in it? And I was like, man, I just tried to buy that thing three or four months ago. And nobody helped me. He was like, well, I know I can get it done. And I was like, hey, please don't leave me out of the deal. Like, I really want to be in a deal. And he's like, well, how much cash are you going to bring? I said, well, it depends on the deal. Let's, let's talk about it. Anyway, he left that day. He went and made an offer without me. It didn't get accepted. And so three or four, maybe even it was four of us originally got together, put a team together, went back, made another offer. It got accepted. And then we added our fifth partner, which is actually our property management guy on the, on this deal. And so it was tw it's 20 units in Richmond, Virginia, in the Churchill neighborhood, um, 23 units, I'm sorry. And a huge reposition. We bought it for 1.23 million and we cleared, we cleared it out. And now we're taking rents from 695 or so to 1195. And we're in the lease up phase right now. We did a complete reno. Um, we added a half bath on the first floor. We had added places for washers and dryers. We took out a wall, went with granite finishes, uh, click and lock plank flooring. I mean, totally Pure gut. Yeah. <laughs> and then added central HVAC as well. So I wow. mean, a huge, huge, huge project. So that had to be a pretty costly renovation, but it seems like the location, I know Alex, I, I've never lived in DC, but I know there's some, a few hot spots in the DMV area and that's one of them, right? Alexandria, uh, uh, Virginia. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So how did that, what did that do for you? As far as uh, you said, the banks turned you down because of lack of experience, right? Um, and at the time, I assume you had only been doing a few single families and a, and a few flips. So that was the base of your experience for, for what you were, uh, what you were showing them. And they wanted, they wanted for you to show the ability that you've done larger multifamilies, correct? Correct. So if you haven't had a commercial loan, you don't have any experience. It doesn't matter how many single family homes you fix or flip or how many single family homes you have in your rental portfolio, you got to get a commercial loan. And so you know, that's typically five units and better. And until you do that, they don't want to lend to you. And so you, you need a partner. And it's funny because a lot of people say, well, how do I get a job if I don't have any experience? And you want somebody with experience for the job. It's the same thing with multifamily, but the answer is always going to be to partner with somebody that's already done it. Yeah, find a partner and and um, and use the group effort. I mean, that's usually they say um, ten percent of something is better than zero percent of nothing, right? 
So it's pretty much that, that whole concept of using a partner a lot. I know a lot of people have, uh, I don't want to say control issues, but uh, they feel like it has to be me. I have to do it alone. Um, it, you know, I want to do the whole entire property and have complete con control of everything, but that's just not the way it uh, works, especially in these larger deals. Um, in, for the most part, everybody always partners. Uh, you need your sponsor. You need your the person with experience. You can maybe bring a person that does property management. It seems like that's exactly what you did. You had a person maybe be the sponsor and then also a person with the experience, person that's doing the deal, person that's r doing the you know, day-to-day -day operations and then possibly a bunch of just, um, of, um, capital, you know, people that's contributing capital as well. So how did you, how did you guys work out the numbers for that? Did you guys do like, you know, 70, 30 split or you guys do, how, how did you guys work that out as far as ownership? Yeah, this is probably the silliest way to do it, but we did it based on cash contributed to the deal. Right? Okay. So, if there was a hundred thousand dollars contributed in total, whatever, if I, if you brought 72,000, you own 72% of the deal. Um, that, but that, that's not and from my perspective today. That's not the right way to do it. Hey, but it got you into the deal. Sometimes, sometimes you got to sacrifice just a little bit of, of what you, what you want, right. In order to kind of get your foot into the door. That's one of the, it sounds like that's one of the, uh, one of those sacrifices. I'm kind of going through it myself as well. When, um, like, I'm looking to close on uh, my first larger deal. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of smaller multifamilies, but you know, trying to push into the commercial space. And uh, that's just one of the things. You, you know, you just gotta. Um, it might not be the your terms. The, at least the first one might not be your terms, but it's going to give you the experience so that you can go forth and and get more deals on your terms, right? So I assume the next deal. Um, you did not, you, you know, you didn't do that. Um, but before we transition on to the next deal, can we talk about some of the lessons you might've learned out of this first deal? Yeah. I think the most important lesson is know who you're partnering with, right? Just so I've, and then know your deal. I've seen a lot of people get into a bad deal just to say they had a deal and that can sink you financially if you're not careful. Uh, the second thing is make sure that you know, the partners that you're partnering with, you guys have an alignment. And if you're not aligned, make sure that your contract protects you. Um, because, you know, the operating agreement is what it, everything comes back to in case something goes wrong. It's all good and everybody's buddies and friends as long as people get what they want. As soon as people don't get what they want, people start throwing tantrums, start doing silly things that may hurt the project. And I mean, I don't have a better way to say this. Doing a JV deal with somebody is like getting married to them. It's just got a defined period. And so you want to know your partner because, I mean, you're, for these smaller loans, anything under a million, you're going to be personally guaranteeing it, right? And so if the deal goes south or if it goes sideways, Somebody's it's you and them trying to figure it out, right? And depending on the language in the loan doc, you know, you can be responsible for the whole thing. And everybody's responsible for, could be responsible for the whole thing instead of just being responsible for your ownership piece. And so you, you really got to make sure you understand what you're signing. I've watched a number of people in my deals not read anything. And when situations came up, they wanted to just make it up. I was like, no, guys, this is covered in this document. We've already decided this before it got started. And you want those things decided before you get into the deal because when emotions are high, people aren't rational in the conversation. And if you've made it when everybody's on the same page and you know people have favorable opinions of each other, you get to a lot more what I think is a reasonable solution. Oh, that's great. That's great, great, great advice. Um, great lessons learned, actually. So um, moving into the next, uh, the next deal after that, is that the, um, well, moving into the next deal after that, so what are you working on now? And um, how have you took, taken the lessons learned from the first deal and move them over to what you're working on now? Yeah, so we've, we've done a number of deals, Dan. Um, so what we're working on right now is a, we're closing a 10 unit next week. Um, but I guess the bigger deal for us is we're developing a 120 unit apartment community in Greensboro, North Carolina, in the, in the east end of town. And we'll be first to market in that area hasn't been any new stock created there since like the 80s. 
Nice. So super excited about that. In fact, we just got approval from the zoning commission for the rezoning uh, on Monday night. Uh, and so it's, it's a big deal for us. And I think it's a big deal for the city. That's great. That, that's the one that, that I kind of wanted to talk about the, uh, the development. Um, Cause I haven't, um, I haven't had anyone talk about developing, uh, developing units uh, yet. So how is, how has that, um, I guess, shifted your mindset? And then also um, how different is that than buying something that's already there and doing the, the whole renovation? So how has that been for you? Yeah, so the great part, and I don't know that everybody makes the connection, right? But with the <clears throat> established multifamilies that are already there, you're buying a business that's tied to real estate. So you've got historical financials, you can understand what the market's doing and how the business is performing, and you identify the problem that you're going to fix in that business in order to increase the net operating income. And that will make the business worth more. With development, uh, some people call it speculation, right? Because you don't know what units are going to rent for. It's a long tail on it. So, you know, we started on this back in May, which is pretty quick. So we contracted the property in May. We're able to do the preliminary engineering, get site plans and, you know, zoning done. And so now we got to go through the process of setting up our permanent financing, um, hiring our architect and figuring out who our general contractor is going to be on the deal. Um, I thought that we wanted to do that internally, but the fact of the matter is there's too many moving parts and too many headaches to do that. I, I think it'll be end up being a full-time job, and I kind of got into the real estate so that I have flexibility and don't have to do specific things at a specific time. So I think I'd be taking a step backwards by doing that. So we'll probably hire that out, even though it'll increase our costs. Um, but... I say all that to say it's going to take us some time to actually get to market, right? So if we break ground next summer, it's going to be six, eight, ten months maybe in order to get the thing put up. And then once we get it put up, we got to lease up. So I want you to tell me on the, what you just what you own, what rents are going to be in 2021. In July, <laughs> right? right? Uh, everybody's worried about a recession and so on and so forth. So. You know, it, there's there's inherent risk in the process. And it's, for me, it's like driving a ship, right? It, it's, it's not a speedboat. I'm not turning on a dime. Uh, it's once you start going, you're kind of committed. And you, you got to see it through the end. And I guess that's really no different than flipping. Once you get into a flip project, you got to finish it. You can't, I guess some people do just walk away, but you, you need to finish it so that you can sell it and even if you're going to take a loss, you want to sell it so that it's off your balance sheet. Um, this one, you know, we've got to, and that's, I guess that's the other great thing about the construction process. Those are personally guaranteed too, right? So if you don't get to the end and you leave, until you can get to the end and lease it up, you can't get back to the non-recourse debt. So they stuff. are, so I didn't know that. I thought when you develop properties, they're usually, they're, they're usually non-recourse. I didn't, I had no idea that you're liable for the, uh, for the, the entire project. You're on the hook until you get it uh, established. And then, you know, there's some type of refinance transition into a permanent debt loan. That's okay. when you actually get out of the recourse. But I mean, they want to make sure that they're going to get repaid and it can't get repaid until the property gets leased up. And so everybody's looking to make sure that they've got the right repayment piece and that's uh, for me the commercial they look at the asset but they also depending on the size of the asset want the people who are sponsoring the project to be responsible for it Every, everybody wants you to have skin in the game of course yeah. of course okay so that's very 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 interesting um the whole redevelopment process um i, I didn't really think about um how long it really takes to do you're talking about breaking ground next summer i mean i, I knew it i knew it took about a year year and a half but um you're, you're talking it seems like you're getting to kind of like the two-year mark right now so um breaking ground next summer and then you gotta actually you know finish the the building process and then yeah just like you mentioned that was going to be my next question because everyone is talking about you know 2020 election what the what the economy is going to look like around that time um and you know if there if there is a recession or if there the market does correct itself, 
uh, what that looks like. Have you guys, I assume you guys have had several conversations about that, right? And uh, what that, yeah. what that, what that looks like. The market is the market, man. Um, I, I personally don't believe we're going to have another, you know, real estate based recession. And so some folks will lose jobs and that's part of the natural cycle of things. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the U S economy is really stable. And so, and then when you get into real estate, things become hyper local. And so, you know, the Greensboro economy is based on schools, manufacturing, and then, you know, you got the working class folks like teachers, police officers, uh, nurses, et cetera. And so that's who we're targeting. We're targeting those folks with incomes between 30 and 70 grand a year. Um, and we think, you know, the vast majority of those folks will be able to stay gainfully employed because they make the world go round. Yeah. Okay. Who did you, who did you use to, to do your market research for the, uh, for the development to make sure, you know, population's right and everything else is, is correct. Did you guys just do that yourself or did you hire that, hire that out? No, we did it internally. I mean, okay. we, you, we got access to, you know, all the data places, yeah. OSTAR, Enodo, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're running comps and we run, we are operating in a market too, Dan. I mean, so we're not just picking a random market and deciding to pop something down. The vast majority of our portfolio is in that city. And so we're watching things turn and change and grow rents. And so it, for us, it's, it's our own backyard, right? We, we should know it like the back of our hand. And, you know, the city's asking for it. So, you know, we have their support. And then even when you get out into the community, they're, they're looking for stuff too everybody with any means is moved into one part of the city and we need to from my perspective get some diversity and spread folks out a little bit and get a bunch of different pockets of you know economic uh development going because at the end of the day if everything's kind of segregated it doesn't work and yeah you know, for me it's, it's all about diversity that is fantastic you're providing you're providing homes are so what this development how what is your um, what is what is your group's expectations for it as far as um, how many units are you looking to build and then also what are you thinking uh, overall costs and then uh, projected rents like just uh, projected cash flow what, what does that look like and then repositioning the asset so it seemed, you kind of alluded to you were going to sell it once I'm assuming you're like 75% rent or something like or it's 75% uh, leased up or um, a certain percentage leased up and you can actually refi out and then I'm assuming sell after that. What, what is your guys' uh, plan for the for the development? So let me do my legal thing. This isn't an offer to sell security. <laughs> I'm not a CPA. I don't have any qualifications. I have no idea what I'm talking about, guys. I'm just telling you. Right. Um, I was talking to another host and he was like, you got to be careful when you talk about your projects that you're working on, because, you know, we are going to raise money on this deal, but I'm not actively soliciting money from sources and not trying to use your platform as an opportunity to do that. But I want to expose people to the development process because most people don't know that you can do this thing. Right. And so really just kind of a case study on how we're getting through this. So it, it's going to be, as the plan says today, it's going to be 116 units and it's going to be a mix of uh, 20 townhomes and 96 apartment buildings. And the apartments or well, not apartment buildings, there's only four buildings, but there's 24 units in each building, right? So three story walk ups, um, a mix of two and three bedrooms. So there's 48 two bedroom apartments, 48 two, three bedroom apartments. And then I'm thinking there's going to be nine three bedroom apartments and 11 two bedroom. I mean, not apartments, townhomes, nine, nine, two, be three bedroom townhomes and two bedroom townhomes at 11. I'm sorry, man. I, I'm doing this all from memory, so please forgive me. I was surprised. I was surprised you got them all. I was yeah, you got them all out. I was. I was expecting for you to say, "Yeah, there's going to be a mix of townhomes and some regular apartments." Yeah. <laughs> you no, I mean, I'm super excited about it, right? <laughs> and then we're going to have a leasing office on site with a fitness center, um, playground, and you know, all of that. Said, we're we're expecting right now rents are you know, ten fifty to twelve fifty for brand new two bedrooms. Some stuff may stretch to 1500 depending on how nice you go, but that, that's not our game. And then the three bedrooms, I, 
I don't know where we'll land on those right now, but it's probably around 1300, give or take, probably 10% one way or the other. And so the goal is, you know, to service that working class community, right? That household income in the, for North Carolina, the average uh, median income is right at $55,000. And so we want those folks to be able to live in our community if they don't have a home. And, you know, what you're seeing with college graduates is student debt is crazy. So they're not buying. Um, you're seeing the baby boomers start to retire. So they're downsizing. And what we're giving, we think is going to be the draw to get people to move out of the areas they typically live in that's highly amenitized is the architectural design. We're going to go with contemporary, um, you know, kind of mid-century, modern, inspired. And, you know, that leads me to how we got to this place on this project. Uh, as I was doing the research, I found out that Greensboro had the second, third, fourth, and fifth licensed architect of African descent in the state of North Carolina. Huh. There was a Jewish guy named Ed Lowenstein who was tied to the Cone family. And Cone, they own um, the healthcare system. They own um, Cone Mills, which was a manufacturing facility. And so Ed was married into that family, and he was providing architectural services to those folks. Uh, he decided to integrate his firm prior to um, it being legislated believe it or not. And so when the folks that were working with them said, hey, what are you doing? We don't want to work side to side with these folks, et cetera, et cetera. He said, if you don't like it, you can leave. And I don't know a whole lot of people know, but Greensboro was a hotbed for the civil rights movement. And so, you know, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, all these guys came to Greensboro through the 60s. And you know, to see this type of chef, to see people embracing and recognizing that things were wrong and doing something about them just excites me. And so actually one of the guys who was hired by Ed back after he graduated from Howard University lives less than two miles from the project site, right? And he's actually still practicing, has one of the most successful architectural firms in the city. Um, but, you know, we, we want to t have something to tell that story. We want to build a monument to that story. But we feel like that sub-market is hungry for it. And uh, the sub-market being Greensboro mm -hmm. at this point, because the only place that you can get that type of design is in downtown Greensboro. And I know a lot of people say, well, that's an urban design. Well, I'm seeing it happen outside of the city in Charlotte. I'm seeing it happen outside of the city in Raleigh and Durham. And so... Greensboro doesn't have that. It's only been used for like public institutions like universities or YMCA's or government buildings. Um, and I want to see that be pulled out into the community. And so that's our goal is to, you know, build that monument so that when, when people show up, they can know that that story inspired it and just put that type of architecture on display. Dude, that is fantastic. So I, I've done a, a few shows and I've listened to a lot of different podcasts and I've never heard anyone speak to the architectural design and also, well, the importance of the architectural design and also the history behind um, a project that they're working on. So that's fantastic. I, and I'm sure that gives you even more pride and more uh, more want to make sure that this project goes smoothly because of um, because of the history that, that you're trying to uh, put into into this project. I strongly commend that. I love uh, pretty much everything you said right there. So that's yeah. that's great. That's great. Okay, so um, just to starting to starting to wrap up just a little bit. Um, can you can you give any advice to any investors out there that are trying to uh, get to where you're at? What's, what is some advice that you would give to them? Yeah, I, my friend and I were having a conversation on Monday night after the, the rezoning approval. And we were talking, I, I was on my way from Greensboro to the Raleigh-Durham airport. And there was a traffic jam in on I-40, which is the major thoroughfare to get there. And I was sitting there, time was tight. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make my flight. I don't know if I'm going to make my flight. And I know, since I knew where I was going, I don't use GPS, right? And I know people who live in more densely populated areas tend to use it to figure out traffic. For me, that didn't make sense. I was like, well, I don't have to worry about traffic. I'll just go the way I know. And so as I was sitting there, I started to panic. And so we pulled out the GPS. 
and we found a different route to get to where we're going. And I could have sat there without the information available to me and someone to guide me to the place that I wanted to get to in the most timely manner. And I might even miss my flight. And he said, I wonder how many people are missing their flights in life, right? I was like, like, you're brilliant. This is what I talk to you every day. And so if you are trying to accomplish something big, get a coach, right? Get somebody that can turn on the light for you so you're not walking around in the dark, hitting your leg on front of you. I did it the hard way. I, I went to Podcast You. I went to YouTube View. For the programs that are out there, I was like, man, I can't afford 30 or 40, 50. Some people pay $3,000 to yeah. get in this game. And we've been developing some stuff to make it more cost effective to get people over that hump because I mean, that initial hurdle is tough. Um, and so we're, we're working with rolling some stuff out. There's um, a website out there, myxmethods.com that is offering coaching at a lower cost. But what I've found is everybody wants the stuff for free. And, you know, we go get in all this student loans and we get in debt for cars and we, we pay for this stuff that I think we want, but I think we've been conditioned not to invest in ourselves, right? And we've been conditioned to try to do it the free way. And I want the business that I'm getting in to pay me money as soon as I start as if it's a job instead of putting some investment in it and planting the seeds and then waiting for them to grow. And so, you know, we're coming up with the alternative to those, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar programs, and we're beginning to roll that stuff out. But even if you don't use me, find somebody who's further ahead than you, and learn from them because it can speed up your process. There's no reason for you to sit in that traffic jam. There's no reason for you to be stuck. Um, work with somebody who's already gotten through the challenges that you're working through, and it will change your life dramatically. That, you, that's my single piece of advice. That is phenomenal. Using a coach as a GPS, and I love the analogy that you use there. Um, that's a, like a real world analogy. I love that. As soon as you said it, you know, I wonder how many people are missing their flights in life. I love that. Um, that's great. That's great. Excellent, excellent uh, information. So um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really, really appreciate it. Um, actually, I'm sorry. How can my how can my subscribers how can my listeners uh, get in contact with you or um, just find out more about you if they want to? Yeah, man, I I've, I've got a bunch of websites out there, but LinkedIn's probably the best one. Um, so connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Jerome Myers in the Greensboro area. Um, if you want to send a form, re- fill out a contact us form, then. Um, my website is developing.com, D3, V3, L-O-P-I-N-G.com. And then we also have the education site up, myersmethods.com, M-E-M-Y-E-R-S-M-E-T-H-O-D-S.com. Hey, everything that was just mentioned here will be right below. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see the, the tags right below. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can just look in the show notes and you'll see all the, all the information there, all the links uh, there. So definitely check out uh, Jerome, check out all, all the movement he's doing. I'll, I'll stay in contact. We'll definitely be in contact. And uh, I really, really look forward to uh, seeing you guys break ground and, and um, develop this property and with, with all this, with all the historical value in it as well. So I'm looking forward to I'll keep following you on IG and listening to or, and looking at uh, the great things that you're doing. So thank you very, very much, Jerome. I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Oh, man, one thing, if you don't mind, can I promote yeah, sure. my podcast, man? Oh, please, please, please. Dreamcasters, hey, guys. Yeah, please. Dreamcatchers, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys, you're listening to podcasts. Hey, we tell the stories of extraordinary or extraordinary. We tell the story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It's the Dreamcatchers podcast. We believe that you shouldn't just chase your dreams. You should catch your dreams. And so... I invite you to hop on either YouTube if you're a video watcher or on your favorite podcasting platform and check us out. I think we've got some amazing stories over there and we'll have Dan over as soon as he gets his first deal closed. Yeah. (laughs) So I'll, um, again, that link will be right below as well. And again, in the show notes as well. So, um, yeah, 
thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Dropped a lot of gems for us. Really, really appreciate that. Yeah, man. Thank you. All right. This is Dan Wynn signing out.